beach side. That's uh, how you get into the building, and then you never want to leave because we are on uh, one of the prettiest beaches in America in a calm, cool afternoon as we welcome calm and cool Mike Griffith from uh, Dog Nation. Mike, uh, it's always good to see you. Let me start with uh, what's been very big news, and that's uh, a lawsuit filed against Billy Napier in Florida last week by a Georgia player. Uh, he didn't start at Georgia, uh, but he's now at Georgia. I know it came up today. Uh, Billy Napier will be here a little bit later on. We'll, uh, our first chance to uh, get his opinion on what's happening, not only with that, but his future, as well as uh, Kirby Smart. Uh, we'll talk about him as well. We'll talk to Kirby Smart as well. But uh, you had a chance to hear everyone today, inclu including Kirby Smart, yeah. being asked about Rashada. Yeah, and, and first of all, Billy Napier, he's already said, we met with him in the hallway, he can't really say anything because there's pending litigation. He's hes comfortable with what he has said, but at the same time, this is different. This is one of those sign of the times things now with NIL and transfers where you've got a player suing a university and a coach over a deal done gone wrong. Now it's millions of dollars and it's got to play out in court. And of course, Kirby was asked about it. Kirby says he just wants to stay in George's little bubble. <laughs> George's little bubbles. Yeah. Nothing big. Two-time national championship coach. Doesn't have time for this. According to Kirby, Rashada came to him the day before and said, hey, I think I got a lawsuit here I'm going to pursue. And, of course, that's his right. We're in America. Right? This so, is the court uh, system. I mean, th there's an interesting aspect to that because some people have maybe overreached the runway by going to Kirby. Kirby was saying. Kirby wasn't saying anything other than thank you for letting me know, right? Well, I mean, that's, you know, it's it's the kid's right. If you're Kirby yeah. smart, you can't take that away from the player. Yes, the player needs to let the head coach know. Might be a headline coming out of Athens here, coach, and it's Kirby's obligation to let this kid have his rights. I mean, that's what NIL is all about right now is player rights playing out in court. The NCAA does no longer lords over these players. They have rights like anybody else in the country, and that involves lawsuits. It's one of these unintended consequences and what we've gotten into now that this has turned into pay for play. And it's really, Paul, it's the tip of the iceberg. We're going to see more of this. And I'm not saying it's good or it's bad, but it's just the way it is. The way Kirby's going to handle this is to keep that an external issue. It's not going to affect Georgia. Rashada was brought on to be a fourth scholarship quarterback. He may compete for the backup job behind Gunnar Stockton. I don't think he's going to win that. I don't think he's going to be significant the first half of the season. Could he ultimately be the Georgia starting quarterback someday after Carson Beck is ridden off into the sunset with a Heisman Trophy ceremony appearance? Don't know if Carson will win it, but Rashada on deck, Stockton on deck, maybe somebody in the portal. Okay, but, well, listen, I don't want to bury the lead here, which is the Georgia football program, which will start the season number one. You've alluded to it already. What's it all about? Are they, are they, well, it's are having they, Carson they back, back, but the difference is, Paul, he doesn't have Brock Bowers to throw to or Ladd McConkey. This is going to be a very inexperienced Georgia receiving core, and Carson Beck, Mr. Cool as a Cucumber, never reacts, never says anything, has got to learn to be assertive. He's got to make the players around him better. We know he's got the NFL arm. We know he solves Rubik's Cube in one minute and reads defenses in five seconds, but can he teach these young receivers and these new receivers to run the routes on time, and can he handle the moment? Because, Paul, in the SEC championship game, he did not handle the moment. Jalen Milrow handled the moment. I, I, I couldn't help but look at that uh, screen there, the, the Clemson game, which is the first game of the season. <laughs> and well, was it three years ago? The game was in Charlotte. It was the number one. It wasn't just the number one game of the first. It was the number one game in college football that year by ranking. And, and now the same two schools are meeting. I don't want to disrespect the 12 o'clock window, but I'm going to. Sure. And that's not on Georgia. I mean, Georgia's still uh, at the top of the – that's on the other guys. Well, it, well, it is. Clemson has obviously fallen off, and even though the Tigers bring, what, a four- or five-game winning streak into this season, I know they beat Kentucky in a bowl <laughs> yeah, game. It hey, did. That's just cause for celebration. It does. Here, Clemson, it, 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 Clemson, anything uh, so, is celebrated. T hard, tough times for Dabo Sweeney in, the, in his lack of use of the transfer portal. But, listen, I, I'm not going to undersell this game because it is the Georgia-Clemson rivalry. Yeah. It's a great traditional rivalry. Clemson's only 70 miles from Georgia. Do you know that as the crow flies, Clemson is actually closer to Georgia 
than Georgia Tech. I mean, this is a really good college football rivalry game, and I don't think Georgia's going to overlook it. Certainly Clemson won't. This Can I ask make you a couple season. other distances? I'm curious, just between play. You seem to have all that down. Well, well no, I was just thinking about it because I, when I saw the game a couple years ago, I said, why don't they play this game more often? Yeah, Georgia, well, you know, Georgia, Georgia Tech. I said, yeah, for the 25 people in the state that care about it, why not a Georgia? You but know if why, you're you not know why Georgia Tech, dude? If you're, I just don't. They're insignificant. If, if, if it's not a significant game, I don't understand why. It's like stepping on an ant. You enjoy that. Now, that said. You've heard, you've, you are aware of the phrase tradition, aren't you? Well, yeah, yeah, tradition. And, and LSU used to play Tulane every year, yeah. too, until they didn't. But at some point, you've got to move forward. And whether or not that game is worthy of the schedule as we move forward into an eight- or nine-game schedule, which, by the way, Kirby Smart kind of went off on that, too. We've always wondered this eight-game schedule, nine-game yeah, schedule. That was Topic number one last year, what happened? Well, what happened is it's moved to the end of the line because we've got all these other pressing oh, okay. issues, and Sankey told us that. He said, look, it's going to get kicked around, but there's a lot bigger issues going on. And Kirby even said that in his nine years, Paul, there's more pressing issues for the SEC right now, more reasons for fans to care about what's happening here in Destin and, and listen to what Greg Sankey has to say than ever before because of all the changes in the sport. But Kirby's take on eight- or nine-game schedule is he doesn't care. What works best for the SEC? Now, if this college football playoff committee is going to value a Georgia schedule that includes a Clemson, that includes at Texas, at Alabama, don't forget rivals, Auburn, Tennessee, if you're going to value those games wow. and take that into consideration, then by all means play them. But if you're not going to value those games and you're going to punish teams for multiple losses, then why go to nine games? It's as simple as that. Does it make sense for the SEC? Do they continue to get as many teams in if they play the nine-game schedules? Because nine games in the SEC is not equal to nine games in the ACC or the Big Ten. Yeah, you know, Heather Dennis just said something a minute ago about you know Florida State. You know, we hope we never have another power, whatever, undefeated. I mean, I never bought that argument, although I understand the traditionalists. How come nobody made a big deal about Georgia not getting in the playoffs last year? Well, that's a good question. I think it was because the Texas win over Alabama just kind of skewed, uh, kind of skewed everything. When right. Texas went into Alabama and beat the Crimson Tide by 10 points, it brought transitive properties into effect. <laughs> Texas beats Here Alabama. We go. Alabama beats Georgia. So that is why, even though Georgia probably was one of the four best teams, Alabama kind of messed them over twice. Once by Nick Saban losing at home by 10 points and what people said was one of the best coaching jobs of his career. <laughs> okay, can we give that narrative up? Because I thought his coaching stunk at the beginning of last ooh, year. Ooh, ooh. Once they figured Milrow out, they kicking, were fantastic. Kicking a dead man now. Let's just be, you know, I don't think he's anything but dead. <laughs> well, we excuse gonna, me, a retired man. Yeah, well, then, no, he's not retired. We are going to get a load hey, of Nick uh, Saban, and he is going to be fantastic this I year. I can't wait. But worry. you cannot tell me that was one of his best coaching jobs. Anyway, that ended up costing uh, I, Georgia I, I, I a playoff spot. That now, Texas win well, over I mean, Alabama. Here's what people meant to say. After he finally took the team back from Tommy <laughs> Reese, who he, he who was like the inherited heir, uh, the, the son, and finally the old man just said, you know what, maybe that wasn't a good decision. Paul, you're not really going there. I mean, what is this translation? Don't blame me. I'm just the head coach. Well, no, I mean, he, come on. He, uh, Saban fell for Tommy Reese. Well, I'm not, and who's to say that Tommy Reese might not one day? Okay, well, be a let's really good let's come back to that because we want to talk about Fair Alabama and, and the new and the new king, Kalen DeBoer. Well, no, wait a minute. The, the, the new the, king at Alabama. Hold, hold that thought. We'll be right back. This guy's not going anywhere. I mean, we've we we got ratings to get back up in the air. Fine Bond Show. We are back here at the beach, and uh, don't forget, uh, wow, that's, that's hard to talk over something that beautiful. Final hour today, we'll talk to Billy Napier, Steve Sarkeesian, uh, as well as Kirby Smart. So uh, a lot to un unpack there as we, and Jeff Levy, as uh, we continue, and Jeff Levy, as we continue with Mike Griffith. Uh, Mike, uh, You've had some. Uh, you, you just got through burying uh, Nick Saban, uh, but uh, I, I hear you have some nice thoughts about Kalen well, DeBoer. Well, first of all, let's let's be specific. I didn't think that last year was one of Nick Saban's best coaching jobs when he had to bench his starting quarterback three games in and lost by ten points at home. The rest of the year, he looked like a Hall of Famer. But Kalen DeBoer is a guy that I'll be honest. I, I was a little skeptical of the hire. Right. I kind of wondered if maybe Dabo Sweeney should have at least got an interview. But he Dab did. Dabo who? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm going to stick with it. Let's let this play out. But DeBoer is really impressive. I, now that he's got both feet under him, 
now that he knows where he's at, now that he gets the environment, he's already making changes. You know, they're going to start practicing in the morning. You start changing things up in Tuscaloosa from the way Nick Saban did it. That tells you a lot. But the way that Coach DeBoer went about it was to talk to his players and his leaders and find out what they were comfortable with. So on the one hand, yes, he realizes that he's inherited a traditionally powerhouse program that's won all these titles under Saban. But at the same time, DeBoer's got to be DeBoer. He's got to be who he is, and he's not afraid to make these changes. I like the fact that he's doing it with input from his players. I like his attitude, and suddenly I even like this NAI experience. You know, with all the changes that are happening, potential roster size going down or up, whatever, whatever the latest rumor is, I think this is a guy that's done it at different levels, that's prepared to do it different ways, and he brings a really good attitude and positivity to the SEC. I, I'm, I'm bullish on Alabama. I think they're going to be the biggest challenger to Georgia this year, not Texas. Uh, we mentioned uh, that Billy Napier will be here later. Yeah. Um, he alluded to the lawsuit today. Uh, he said he's comfortable. I mean, whatever they told him to say, I'm sure he said. <laughs> um, but in terms of how he has handled the offseason, a lot of the Florida writers that I was with this morning are very praiseworthy. Well, he, he gave him interviews. He talked to him, basically. He knows he's in trouble, and he said, all right, guys, come on, uh, you know, come on in. And, you know, they shared a little information. Listen, Billy Napier is a good football coach. Paul, I don't know, and, and I guess I would ask you this, I don't know if I've ever seen a collection of coaches this good. Now that you're adding these two coaches from Oklahoma and Texas, this league is as deep as it's been. I mean, Mike Elko stand up there. I'm, this guy's an all-star coach. Yeah. Sark's up there. I mean, this guy's an all-star coach. He's been in the NFL. Kiffin's going to be around later this afternoon to talk to him. His offenses are fantastic. Kirby Smart is, is on fire right now. This league is deep and talented. I don't think Billy Napier is a bad coach per se. I think he came into a tough situation, and I think he tried to do too much, and I don't think it's his place for on-the-job training. I mean, we haven't even talked about Brian Kelly, the winningest coach in Notre Dame, you know, can't even get a spot in the theater down there to talk to the media these days. But you got to look at what Billy Napier inherited and where he's at. Now, I will say this. They've got this new football building there in year two of the Havner Center. This is making a difference, and if they get off to a good start and they get some momentum, I'm not convinced that Billy Napier can't stick around for another year. Yeah, no, he's got to the schedule that gives him a chance to to blast off. Uh, conversely, we all know what happens if you don't blast off. You mentioned Brian Kelly. Um, there's the Florida schedule, by the way. What I'm talking about there before we, we switch, Miami, that is such a big game. Uh, it's hard to respect Miami based on what they've done recently, but that, that coach down there has got some credibility as well. That's, that's on the line this year, but he can turn it. Uh, A&M, you mentioned Elko, Mississippi State, Tennessee at the end of that run before the, the gauntlet begins. Brian Kelly, it seems like that program uh, is really trending well. So pick up what you were saying a minute ago. Well, he loses a lot, and I thought it was a red flag when he starts talking about not buying players. Look, they're all buying players. It's show me the money time, and you have to pay money to get elite talent. And the fact that Brian Kelly, I, I'd love to hear the, the backwards excuse for why he would say something like that. You have to pay well, money well, I, to if get I, quality If I could interrupt my guess. Please do. He was simply ex explaining a specific situation there about uh, an interior lineman. And I personally uh, listened to the entire interview. It just feels to me that, not you, because you're covering Georgia, but a lot of the national pund pundits just went overboard on Brian Kelly. Well, I, that particular sound, but Brian Kelly knows better. This is one of the most well-spoken, right, articulate coaches in the business. But I, mean, I think, I think it was done a disservice, though. One of the though, best by hires the, of the offseason. By the, by the yappy media. What he did with Jaden Daniels was incredible, yeah. but he loses a lot of firepower. I like LSU. I know they've got the resources in place. A dip for LSU is an 8 or 9 or 10 win season. This is a program that's going to compete for more national titles, but I don't think this year. About two minutes left, and I always feel like um, with you, uh, I, want, I need to get out of your way. Uh, so in the final minute or two, like what – what are you thinking about as you're walking the beach, as you're, you know, meandering around? As, you know, what, what's burning inside you about this next couple of months? How much of this off-the-court uh, settlement material is going to affect college football? I mean, Greg Sankey made a fantastic point yesterday. Everybody's got an idea for how it should be. How things are right now, Sankey said it. it. It's never been a better time to be a collegiate athlete when you talk about freedom of movement, when you talk about NIL, the gear, the medical treatment, the training that you get, and no taxes. Things ain't too bad right now. 
if you're a college athlete. Now, I don't know if this is a sustainable model, but I wonder, Paul, how these NIL deals affect locker rooms. I wonder about the opt-outs, uh, hoping that the 12-team playoff will keep more of these players engaged because they'll have an opportunity to go to the postseason longer. We won't see as many opt-outs, so we'll see a better postseason. And I want to see how these different programs manage this with their fundraising. Somebody's got to come up with this money. Do you shorten the coaches' contracts so you don't have to pay these ridiculous buyouts? Do you ask more from your donors? Do you charge more for your seats? Somehow or another, college football has to propel itself. But in the meantime, we've got an unbelievable season on tap. I can't wait to see Texas and Oklahoma, the Texas and the Texas A&M rivalry. I mean, Sark talked about it today. He better win it because he's not going to win the SEC. That game is going to be incredible. I cannot wait to see that football game. I can't wait to see what happens at Oklahoma and how these teams mix in the SEC. Winning in the Big 12 is one thing. Doing it in the SEC every week, that's another. Mike Griffith uh, joining us never disappoints. Uh, always fantastic, especially to spend a little extra time. We will visit with you uh, a lot over these next few weeks and certainly see you, it sounds strange to say, in Dallas for the <laughs> SEC Media Days. Look forward to it. Thanks, Paul. Mike Griffith is joining us. We'll talk to uh, the one and only Brett McMurphy coming up next. I mentioned the four head coaches in the final hour. We're live down.